On this channel, we've often talked about how objects that move in a straight line can be said to have some amount of energy as a result of this motion. And we've often said that this is the kinetic energy of the object. But in reality, we've been a little bit woolly with our definition of kinetic energy. What we're really talking about here is the linear kinetic energy, which is the energy an object has due to its motion in a straight line. But what about if the object is not moving in a straight line? How much energy does this ball gain, for example, if it spins about its axis but does not move along any straight line? That's what we'll look at in this video. If you enjoy it, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Okay, so to work out how much energy this ball gets purely due to its spinning, we first need to talk about a new type of kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy. This is the energy associated with the angular motion of an object. In other words, when it moves along a curved path or spins along an axis rather than moving in a straight line. Now, we can imagine that this energy depends on a couple of different things. Firstly, how fast the ball is spinning. It makes sense for the ball to have more energy if it's spinning faster. And secondly, something about the ball itself that's related to how much mass it has and perhaps its size or shape. A heavier ball may be more difficult to start spinning and its shape may also impact its ability to rotate. It turns out that the rotational kinetic energy of an object is dependent on exactly these factors. The equation that we want to look at is this one here. E is the rotational kinetic energy that we're trying to calculate. I is what is known as the moment of inertia, which accounts for the mass and the shape of the ball. And omega is the angular velocity, or a measure of how fast our object is moving. Let's look at these properties in more detail, starting with angular velocity. Angular velocity is a measure of the angle that our object turns by in a given unit of time. For example, its angular velocity could be something like 45 degrees per second or pi by four radians, which is usually the more preferable unit to use for angles in physics. Pi by four radians per second would be its angular velocity here. It's really useful to define a term like angular velocity because it makes our system a lot easier to deal with. If instead we chose to look at how much distance is covered due to our ball's rotation as a measure of its spin speed, then we would quickly run into trouble. For example, we could work out how much distance this point on the ball moves as a result of its spin every second. To do that, we could trace out the path that this point takes in one second, and that looks like this. But then we could choose another point on the ball and see that in the same amount of time, it doesn't move the same distance. So which point on the ball should we use as a way to measure its speed? Instead, it's much easier to use the angle it covers per unit time, its angular velocity. Next, let's take a look at this quantity, the moment of inertia. This is what accounts for how difficult it is to get the object to move as a result of its mass and shape. The moment of inertia is basically a measure of how much torque or rotational force we need to apply in order to get a specific rotational acceleration. Just like how mass is a measure of how much force we need to get a linear acceleration in an object. And there are lots of interesting parallels between these quantities linked to rotational motion and these quantities linked to linear motion, as we'll see shortly. But before we look at that, let's talk more about moment of inertia. For any object, this quantity is calculated by considering a small chunk of mass making up the object and multiplying that mass by the square of this distance to the rotation axis, the perpendicular distance. Then we do the same for all other chunks of mass making up the object and add up all these contributions to find the overall moment of inertia for the object. Now, the implications of this are really interesting. First, let's consider that the moment of inertia of a hollow ball is different to that of a solid or filled sphere of the same mass. In other words, this suggests that spinning a hollow ball is in some way different to spinning a fully solid filled in ball. It takes a different amount of torque to get these to have the same angular acceleration, even though they have the same mass and are both spherical with the same radius. Even more interestingly, the moment of inertia of an object depends on what axis we spin it round. 
for a ball, rotation about an axis through its poles has a different moment of inertia to, for example, attaching the ball to a stick and spinning it around this, even if the stick had zero mass. And again, this makes sense because it's not equally easy to spin the ball about either of these two axes. And I find this rather interesting. Not only does the rotation of our object depend on the object itself, but it also depends on what axis we rotate it around. Okay, at this point, it's worth having a look at the similarities between linear kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Both of these energies have a similar form, a half times some quantity that measures its resistance to motion, which is mass in the linear case and moment of inertia in the angular case. And these are multiplied by the square of some speed, linear here and angular here. And even though the units of these quantities may individually differ, the combination of units in these formulae ensures that the overall unit in both cases is the joule, which is great since we're calculating energy. Finally, we can calculate how much rotational energy this ball has when it spins about this axis. This is what the moment of inertia for a filled sphere about this axis can be calculated to be. And we know the mass and the radius of the sphere. In addition to this, we can put a dot on the ball and time how long it takes for it to complete one full rotation, which is 360 degrees or two pi radians. And combining all this information, this is what the rotational kinetic energy ends up being. For reference, that's the same amount of energy the ball would have if it weren't spinning, but rather moving in a straight line at this speed. So pretty intense. And that is how much energy our ball has because of its spin or rotation about this axis. And with that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Check out my merch linked in the description below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, I'd like to thank my Giga patrons and all other patrons over on my Patreon page, which is also linked below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.